All right, so tonight I wanted to share with you a little bit of my experience going from Ruby to Go. And um, I think we should just be open for questions. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand and you can actually stop me anytime. That's totally fine. So do any of you recognize this number? What? Pi? No, that's not pi. <laughs> you're, you're, you're flying. All right, this is this is the golden ratio. This is this is the golden ratio. Yeah, you said phi. I just wanted to give you a hard time. Um, so this is the golden ratio, and that's basically this magic number that uh, we find in math, in art, in nature that basically makes almost everything aesthetically pleasing. It's also related to the Fibonacci sequence, but that's a different problem, a different uh, question. So this is, for instance, when you take um, a photographic class, when you learn how to take photos, one thing they teach you is framing. And when you learn how to frame, we teach you how you will use this ratio to create the right framing. We also find that in art, um, you know, a lot of different places where this ratio is making a lot of sense to make things pleasing. Some people are so obsessed, some of the cubists actually created this entire sub-movement only using or really focusing on this golden ratio. It can be found everywhere uh, from nature um, to really weird things. <laughs> so it can be used for good or evil. Uh, but you find it everywhere. And really, um, as a kid, when I discovered this, this concept, I was very fascinated to understand, are there more patterns out there that we can find that we could use um, and that would help us do things better? Don't take a picture of me in front of that. <laughs> so uh, in 2013, I started my own company, Splice. And um, there's a big shift between being an open source contributor being a team member, being a team lead, and actually owning a company and being the CTO and having to make the decisions. Because when you're not the CTO, it's always somebody else's fault. Um, but when it's your fault, then really you have no excuses. And what I was trying to think is, how can we do things, how can we do things in a better way? So let me just give you a quick introduction to our product. It's very complicated if you're not a musician, so I won't go into details. It's very simple if you're a musician, but basically it's version control for music. So musicians use their own tools and they create music. And as they create music, they don't have, a, they don't have something like Git or GitHub. They cannot go back. So if they make a change, they cannot undo more than once. And that's kind of insane as a programmer. You will not think that actually makes sense. Uh, they cannot branch their music. So as they make progress, and what we've seen is a lot of musicians have a tendency to maybe abuse drugs and other products. And then they go kind of insane overnight. And then they come back in the morning and like, this is insane. And then they cannot go back. <laughs> so we provided a solution for that. And it's basically version control for music. Um, so basically, the way it works is people use their, pro their, their normal tools. And every time they save, we track what they're doing. We get all the information. They can do collaboration. They can get a bunch of content. They can release their music. Uh, this is not a very well-known product. But everybody who's producing music actually knows it, most of the big EDM and hip hop people you know uh, are using a platform. It's working very well. But when everything started, I was coming from this world where I started by, you probably should not look at that, but I started by writing <laughs> kind of terrible code for many years. Um, and then I discovered Ruby. And then I was like, ah, this, this is amazing. It's like Perl, but better. Uh, which Maybe that doesn't sound really good, but <laughs> to me at that time, it was actually really good. Uh, so I wrote Ruby for about 10 years. I played with a bunch of different languages. I wrote Scala and Clojure professionally also on the side. Uh, I did some Objective-C with Mac Ruby. I, I actually worked on the implementation of the Ruby language. Um, and I played with different things. But then it came to a point where like, I have to choose a technology for my own platform. I need to make a choice that's going to affect my personal life, my financial outcome, and all the employees we're going to have over time. So I had to choose between a bunch of different languages I knew, and I ended up choosing Go. And I chose Go, and from there on, I mainly wrote Go. Um, and what I want to share with you is mainly my experience through that. And it's not a technical talk in the sense, like I'm not gonna answer, I'm not gonna show you a bunch of code. I'm gonna talk to you about the experiences and the scars I had going through this process. So let's start by the worst things. Um, 
when you give birth to a project like that, when you invest so much of your life, there are things you learn. And I think this is probably the most valuable because my personal experience is not really, it's really specific to what I experience. And I'm not saying you guys should all use the same technology, you should use the same tools, but I, I do believe that my experience and the lessons I learned could help other people. So the first step was to go from, for me from Ruby to Go. So I wrote Go on the side before, but I never really took Go and built a company around it. It was the first time. And at that time, also, Go was really not used for many APIs. It was used a lot for low-level system things. And what I discovered is that it was a very liberating process. Because Go had a very strong culture of telling you, don't do too much. Do as little as you can and try to do it the best you can. But don't try to do too much. There were no frameworks. And um, it's kind of the, co the opposite of the Ruby culture. When the Ruby culture is kind of this opulent culture where you get a lot of things and you have a lot of gems and you can do things very quickly, um, but you don't really, you don't have the concept of, of simple, you have a concept of easy. And Go is kind of the other way. It's like, no, 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 it's minimalism. You do less and less is better. Um, in some cases, it's, it's frustrating. In a lot of cases, when you start a brand new project, it's actually liberating. And in my case, that was that. The challenge is that there, was, there were a lot of unknown. So when you start a project with a new programming language and you're trying to do something very different and you don't have any frame of references, it's quite scary at times. The good news is that the Go community was really good and I was able to reach out to a lot of people who helped me correct what I was doing wrong. Um, there were no jams, no frameworks. So you have to do with what the language gives you. And it turns out the language and the standard library gives you a lot of different tools that are very useful to get started. But what, what I really learned through this process is that I changed my focus on what I was thinking about when I was writing code. A lot of times when I was writing Ruby, I was thinking about the libraries I would be using and we would have a discussion with the team about like, do we want to use this auth library or this auth library? Do we want to do this or that? When we go, we ended up spending more time thinking about the domain problem and less about the library of how we want, what, what is the style we want to, to use because the language really is a minimalistic language that forces you to think about what you're writing, not how you're writing it. Um, the big gain for us doing that was performance and maintenance. The one thing I did not expect is that maintenance dropped drastically. Uh, I used to make a joke in saying that it was like 42% less maintenance. I think it's actually more like 69% less maintenance nowadays. Like we do not touch all code almost at all. And we have very few bugs in production that are actual bugs. There might be logic implementations, like for instance, we didn't think about this use case in billing, but we really rarely have like a weird bug because the code was written in a certain way. And it might be due to the team, but I think it has a lot to do with the language and, and how um, it forces you to write simple code. The second thing was we moved from Rails to Angular. So what I didn't say is that the framework started, the, the stack started by Go in the back end and Rails in the front end. And the reason is because Rails um, was a known product. We knew how to use the framework and we knew we could get the output we wanted really quickly, but we didn't trust it to do all the API and all the heavy lifting. So we used Rails in the front end and Rails was talking to uh, go with the APIs. We also have a Windows and a Mac client talking to the APIs. But the problem is the Rails app, first the rendering was getting a bit slow as we were getting more and more traffic. So when you had like dead mouse releasing something on our platform, all of a sudden we get like a big spike and then we need to like crank up a bunch of servers and that doesn't really make me happy because I have to pay the bills now. Um, and the other problem is that it was becoming a bottleneck. Um, and the third problem is that our engineers sometimes, because th they're a bit lazy, they're like, why do I have to use this API, the database right here, let me just read some data here. And then they started kind of accessing the information directly and that created this lack of separation of concern. And we said, okay, we want to really split things and we want the front end to be the front end and the back end to be the back end. And we want people to specialize because we had um, back end people, we were, we were thinking, and I was very naive, and I was thinking like everybody can be a full stack engineer. And we had uh, this awesome developer, Katrina Owen, who hated writing HTML and CSS. Don't even ask her to write JavaScript. Actually, she liked JavaScript better than CSS. But it was like, 
you know, when you're full stack engineer, you should be able to do everything, but she hated doing that part. And then we had like this front end engineer that I will not name. Every time we would write Go code, you know, the rest of the team would go nuts. He's like, well, why are you doing it this way? Like, it's so simple, you cannot do it this way. Um, and then we, we realized we need to specialize our, our code a bit better so people would be happier and be able to uh, write in a way that makes sense. The third item uh, we discovered when we went from Rails to Angular is performance. And performance is very interesting because at first you get huge performance boost by going to all JavaScript. But over time you realize you have a lot of different issues. And I can talk more about that in, in the question section, but um, I will open for question at the end. Just so you know, latency is a big deal in JavaScript, especially when you make a lot of API calls. And then of course the payload uh, size is interesting. Um, the big issue we've seen when we switched from Rails to Angular was actually the test suite. Writing tests with front-end engineering uh, when it's just JavaScript is much harder than doing uh, Rails testing. Um, I'll talk more about some of these details later on. The other thing we did that was actually really good for me was switching from JavaScript to TypeScript, and that only happened probably four or five months ago. Um, but we stop writing JavaScript, we only write TypeScript, and we keep on, as we move on, we take all code and we're writing TypeScript. That was a huge, huge gain for us. We were not sure about it. So to give you an idea, on the six people who were making this decision, it was basically split a third, a third, a third between JavaScript, ES6, and TypeScript. So we had two people in each who wanted to try that. So what we did is, well, we did all three at once. Um, we started writing some ES6, we started writing some TypeScript, and we time, we time boxed that. We said we will not do it for more than a month. And it turns out that TypeScript is basically ES6, but as uh, types, and types are really, really great when you use an IDE, when you use something like Visual Studio Code or Atom, that gives you right away all the information you want. You get this feedback loop that's extremely quick, um, and that's super useful. So we ended up choosing TypeScript, and the other people were still not convinced, but I can tell you now, when we go back to the previous JavaScript code and we look at it, everybody agrees it, it, we really don't want to write code the same way anymore, and we moved on to TypeScript, and we're very happy with that. Um, next step was Angular to Angular 2. So that's uh, still in process, um, because Angular 2 is not production ready, and you probably should not use it in production, even though we've been doing it for a few months now. Uh, the problem is Angular 1 is extremely slow, uh, or should not say that, but depending on what you do, it, it can be quite slow. And the reason, without getting too much into the technical details, is you have a concept of a digest cycle. And what it does is like it's checking constantly if things have changed. So imagine if you have a bunch of objects in your, on your page, it's like, have you changed, have you changed, have you changed, have you changed? And when, in our case, we might be displaying, you know, 500 sounds with a lot of different interactions, a lot of different things happening, it really slowed it down. And we created some BitMaker apps on the web, we did a bunch of stuff like that, and we had issues with that. So we had to use Angular 2. And if you have questions, I can talk about React versus Angular 2, we actually tried both. Uh, the performance gain has been really good, but the main improvement we've seen was with designing the architecture of our apps. Um, in Angular 1, I could not touch the code. It was like, I don't know if you've ever seen some old Rails code that you have to support, probably some that I wrote at the beginning. It's terrible, and you're like, oh my god, what, what, what did I do? Our Angular code was like that. We basically didn't know what we were doing at the beginning, and it's all in scope, and it's, it's, it was really nightmarish. But with Angular 2, everything is a component. Um, it's, it's written in TypeScript, and we have like a TypeScript file, we have an HTML file, the CSS file, we can share it. We actually share it between mobile and not mobile. And um, I think TypeScript behind that also helped a lot. So we're still in the process. There's a lot coming on with um, Angular 2. I was at Google I.O. and I was talking to the Angular team and uh, the AOT, so they do ahead of time compilation, so they can verify your templates ahead of time. You can actually export the HTML directly, so you can have static information for SEO, um, and you can target mobile. There's a lot of really exciting things going on on the front end size. Some of the negative things, uh, one, it's not fully baked, so you <laughs> have a lot of issues. Um, it's pretty big also in size, so um, if the payload is, is a problem, it's a bit challenging. Um, and as I said, it's a moving target right now. You probably should wait a couple months before you, you start using it. So this were kind of the, the really quick um, 
process of moving from Ruby all the way to Angular and, and Go. What I want to do now is reflect on some of the higher level uh, lessons I learned. And if you have any questions, you can please stop me. So one of the lessons I learned very quickly is defining the edges of the architecture. And what I mean by that is talking about how we had Rails in the middle and Go talking to it, but Rails was still doing the authentication. Um, and Rails was actually sometimes accessing the database. And that was really a problem because you end up with what I call black holes in your system. Just like parts of the code like nobody really wants to touch and it's like, eh, it kind of works, but just don't touch it. Um, and that's usually because the interface is not well defined. So what we did instead is really make a very clear uh, separation and isolation between things like how do you access an HTTP um, API for doing something specific. So we basically define all the different touch points. The clients will access it a certain way. The mobile app will access it this way. The data store is being you know, behind this gate. This is how you access things. And by creating all these different modules, you end up by having less issues like we did by cutting, by, by cutting corners and having Rails doing some of the things it should not have been doing. And it took us longer than we wanted to actually get out of that. So make sure you define these edges quickly. And we, could, we didn't have to do it at the beginning. We just took this shortcut and we didn't think about the costs that, um, that, that would, the cost of, of this, making this decision. The second one is um, something we're doing, and I don't know a lot of people are doing that. I've been talking to Chad Fuller about this concept, which is designing microservices within the same process. And uh, when I started Splice, it was 2013, and of course everybody was all into SOA and microservices. I think people are still excited about it. Um, but the problem is that there's a cost to microservices. You need to deploy them, um, you need to communicate between them, you get latencies. And I was not willing to pay this price, but I really like the idea of really keeping things um, as small components. And so what we're doing in Go is all these components we have in our system are separate packages with an external API that's exposed. And everybody's talking through these uh, this APIs with interfaces so we can then take these small components when they grow big enough and they need to be on their own and split them into their own uh, process. But most of the code is running currently um, within its own process, but we can split it whenever we want. And by keeping this very isolated, it forces you when you write the code to think about who's gonna consume your code and how it's gonna be consumed. So that has been a really big uh, learning lesson for us. Also, just to give you an idea, this one process that runs the, most of the API is between 10 and 15 megs um, per machine. So it's really, really small. And there's really no need for us to like split it, except when there's too much traffic uh, on the specific parts of the app. So we want to actually load balance it differently. And then we, at that point, we actually start a different process for it. Tooling. Um, two things in tooling. One is I rediscovered compilers. And compilers are actually great when they're fast. So that's the one thing is I used to deal with compilers that were really slow. And then they're also very, very picky, so you have to give them so much information ahead of time. But when you start using modern languages, you realize you get inferred types, meaning that you don't always need to define the type of your objects when you declare them. So it feels like a really a scripting language. Um, and what's very interesting with compiler is not that it will catch a bunch of production errors you might have, it's that the feedback loop on the stupid bugs, and I know all bugs are stupid, but most of the stupid bugs I write are like typos or you know, calling a property that was removed or things like that. Um, the compiler will catch that and will tell you right away. So you're saving time twice. One is because you get the feedback as you type it. So uh, the code completion will tell you what's available and um, you will actually put the right information. It will tell you if you're making a typo, which I make, I make a lot of typo. Um, I didn't know I was making that many typos before I started reusing the compilers, by the way. And then the second thing is you don't end up writing as many tests as you were doing it before. Because a lot of tests I was writing in Ruby um, are not needed when you have a compiler because the compiler would check for a bunch of these things. So you're writing tests thinking more like a user and not like a compiler. Um, and that has been very useful and we use it for both Go and TypeScript. And that has been a huge gain, especially for the front end, I would say. 
because on the front end, you end up with like a JSON object, and then you have like 15 different properties, and the compiler will actually help you um, do the right things. So you don't have to be the compiler. Um, the other tooling we use a lot is continuous deployment. And I know it's something that people really get excited. I'm not really too excited about ops and sysadmin things, but continuous deployment really helped me reduce my stress because the problem I have is when we have a team working on a feature for like a week, two weeks, that's like super scary to me. Having this long running branch is something that I really don't enjoy. And I mean, this continuous deployment process is really easy for us now because you have your feature, you uh, create a pull request, you get it merged onto staging, gets deployed right away. Um, we do have a process where QA is verifying and then they merge themselves into, um, into prod and it goes directly. But we rarely have code on a branch for more than a couple of days. What we do have though is we have feature flags. So you cannot always deploy every single feature within a couple of days. Some features take a long time and you need user feedback. But what we do is um, we have feature flags and a feature flag is basically just uh, a flag you put on the user to turn on or turn off some specific features. So we have that in the back end. Um, you can go and choose the users. They can do whatever they want. And then you can deploy your code and for instance, only employees will be able to see some features. That has really changed our life because we were able to push a lot of code and not being worried about doing a big, big deployment all at once. Uh, we can also do a lot of testing before it, uh, the feature is out. The last thing I learned um, in, in that level of lesson learn is QA. Um, I used to work at Sony PlayStation, I did video games. And we had like 150 probably just in my studio, 150 QA people working 24 seven. It was insane. Like these guys were like, we were telling them like, run against the wall 15 times, tell me if you go through. And it was like, the guys were doing it. Um, I really did not understand the value of QA. I'm like, oh, for video games, I guess it's hard. I cannot really write a test. I would like go against the wall 15 times to see if I can go through the mesh, but, um, when we hired a first QA engineer, which was too late in our process, he found so many bugs. Like, I could not believe it. Like, I remember I like, I almost cried. I was like, how do we ship such a <laughs> shitty product? Like, I felt so bad. Um, and that's because we were writing tests, but we were writing tests from our engineering perspective. We were testing what we were building the way we built it. When you have a QA person coming in, they write it like as a real user. And then they do things to break it. Like they really try hard to break it. When the engineers are like, yeah, I tested it, right? It was like, uh, it's fine. So QA, it turns out, it's actually quite a cheap resource to acquire in a sense of like, you are hiring one person and they're gonna find so many issues that would potentially make your product so much better. Don't wait too long. Uh, we have now two QA people. Um, they, the first one started as a manual tester. We did not know anything about programming, and the second one came from a boot camp school. And they're writing automated tests in Go. Uh, we use web drivers, and they do end-to-end -end testing. The other reason why QA is very important is because even though we have unit tests, it's really hard to test the entire end-to-end um, -end experience. And what they do is that they actually write real scenarios based on support tickets and based on what they're doing, and they run that against staging and against production and we get some very good results because whenever there's a bug, they can actually test it as it would happen live. Um, so I would recommend people to think more about QA. Most startups don't do QA, but yeah, you have a question? You said the uh, person that doesn't already code to writing Go code? Yeah, it's writing Go code and I would love to talk to you about that because that was so much easier for them than doing Ruby or JavaScript. Because again, it's the compiler. So 90% of the mistake you make as a beginner is typos and you don't know what you're typing. When the compiler is doing code completion for you, and when you're doing something, it tells you, hey, this is exactly what you did wrong before you even start the test. And some of the tests can take five minutes. So you don't want to like run your test for five minutes and tell you, oh, you made a typo, you forgot here, you need like parentheses or something, which is 90% of the bugs. Um, so they're writing Go and it's going well. Yeah. Are they using sort of a testing library or just a standard library? So they use a standard library and then we use a, web, a Go web driver that was written by Pivotal Labs called Agudi. And uh, what Agudi lets you do is set up and say, okay, I want you to start Chrome, or I want you to start Safari, and then uh, go to page, click, do this thing, and they can test mobile. And they have like a small packages of small helpers they do, they use, and it's kind of like Capybara, if you will. The difference is that it runs multiple processes uh, and multiple go routines, so it's much faster than Capybara, and you don't have like some of the weird stuff you get with Capybara. But I was very impressed because they're running all the tests. So 
the, the process is we define the feature we want to, to, to build. We have a discussion where we work with Google Slides and we look at wireframes, and QA is usually involved, and they start preparing their tests ahead of time. And then when they get the first stuff in staging, they write the basic tests. And I mean, it's not really complicated tests. Like, user register, it goes there, it does this, does that. But they can write all these tests, and they're catching most of the errors. And I can tell you, we tried with JavaScript, it was much harder for them to write it because they had to wait until the test was running. So there's a bit of a learning curve, but it was actually not that bad. Um, simplicity. Um, that's something that, as a previous Perl developer in a previous life, I did not really understand until much later. Um, but even in Ruby, there's a lot of time when you look at code and you're like, wow, the guy who wrote that must be super smart. Well, now when I look at this code, I'm like, wow, the guy who wrote this really doesn't know what he's doing. Because if you write code that a junior developer cannot understand, you're writing code that's overly complicated and it doesn't need to be the case. And where we, we come from is we have some of the, the best programmers I've ever worked with write code and when I look at it, I can understand. If I can understand it, you guys will understand it too. It's so simple, I'm like, oh, I know what it means. It might be slightly longer, so instead of one line, it might be five lines. But I know exactly the intention and how it's done. And I believe that if we take a junior person on board and they look at the code and like, I really have no idea what's going on here, that's for me a sign that we need to, to rewrite that code in a better way. There are some cases where there's some knowledge that's needed. We do binary parsing, we do some complex stuff. Um, they might not know, you know, things about magic headers and things like that, but at least the code, they should be able to understand the code. If you cannot understand the code, I think there's something wrong with the code, it's with the person who wrote it. Also, um, what we, we seem to forget is that writing code is not just for the computer. It's also a collaboration effort. You write code for other people too. So if you're writing code just for you, that's not really writing code, that's just being selfish. Well, it is technically writing code, I guess, but it's selfishly writing code. Um. <laughs> All right, so that was us for many years cooking our patches. Um, and I just want to finish by giving you even a higher level lessons I personally learned and I will keep on using over time and less specific to Go and Ruby. And then I will open up for questions. The first thing is the quest to always using the best technology is futile. I really had this idea, the same way you have this golden ratio, I could find the right technology. If I was smart enough and I could really decompose things, I would be able to find the right technology to use at the right time. And what I can tell you is that we have to make decisions as leaders, but most of the time we'll be wrong, or a lot of times we'll be wrong, and we need to live with it, and we cannot predict the future. What's important is to be very honest about what mistakes we're making and how we're making them and to be able to deal with them. So in some cases that means, hey, that was a wrong choice, let's do something about it. But sometimes like it was a wrong choice, but there's nothing we can do, we have to deal with it. Um, but that's the, way, that's the way it is. Also, when I feel bad about a bad technical choice I made, I always think of Facebook. Facebook was written in PHP. <laughs> and they really, I would, I would say they didn't choose the best technology, but they managed to be one of the biggest company and doing something pretty amazing. So, you know, again, you won't be able to make the perfect choices, but you should be able to deal with it. The second thing that's actually a bit more sad is that poor technical choices are like a bad student loan. So you keep on like having to pay for years and years and they have accumulated debts and like you're like, oh, man, I don't know how I'm gonna deal with it. Uh, thankfully, I was not born in this country. I had free education, so I don't really know what it means, but I was told, <laughs> My wife is actually American, and yeah, that was not fun uh, when I discovered student loans. The other thing is, when you start having like all these technical debts, you have a tendency to make excuses and try to forget, and that's why I, I talk about the drinking problems, like, yeah, well, it's okay, that's the way, and then you start making excuses, like, well, but you know, we, we were on a road, well, we had to ship this thing, like, you, you start making excuses, but technical debts don't go away unless you actually work on them. Um, so even though you don't want to, you're gonna make mistakes, make sure you kind of think about um, the cost of this uh, technical debt. And you need to be very honest about where you're at with technical debts. Um, in a previous company I worked, at, I worked at, Leading Social, when I came in there was so much technical debt. I actually literally left the, the position I was in uh, to work for like six months just rewriting code 
to make it so we could do interaction with the code. The technical debt was huge, and that's not a fun thing to do. Uh, as an engineer, it might be an interesting problem for some people, but I can tell you it's not the easiest thing to do. So be very honest about technical debts. It, you're going to be generating technical debt. There's no way you write code without technical debt, but you need to be honest to see where you add over your technical debt and when do you have to start paying it back. Also, very true, startups' death are very, very rarely linked to technical decisions. Can you give me five companies or gone because of technical decisions that were poor? I mean, yeah, they might have been hacked or there might be something really bad, but most of the time, that's not really the issue. Most of the time, a startup going away, it's because it was not a good market fit, they could not raise money, they could not find the right users, um, management was bad, leadership was bad, the team was not right. But really rarely is an issue of, of technical stack. And you know, engineers have a tendency of focusing and believing that a company will be successful only because of them. And that's very, very selfish. I can tell you, even though I'm a CTO, and technical, the technolo technology part of our stack is very important, it's not what's going to make our product successful or not. What's important is that we can support the team, but we're as important as everybody else, not more important than everybody else. So even though sometimes we're like panicking about, oh my God, this is like we have so much technical debt, we cannot build anything. If the rest of the company needs you to do something, you need to find the right balance. And that's probably one of the hardest things you can do. But you need to remember that the future of the company is not within your hands. You're helping as a team the company, but it's not just on you. Finally, you need to make uh, choices, especially if you're a team lead uh, or CTO. You need to, to make some, some choices sometimes that are risky. Um, what I mean by that is not all choices are risky. It's like kind of the stock market. You can buy stock or you can buy bonds. The problem is if you only buy stock, well, the market might tank and that's game over. If you only buy bonds, you don't make any risk. And I think when you're the one making decisions or when you're leading the people making decisions on the technical um, choices, you want to think about the risk and the reward. You cannot, the way I say it is like you have a budget and each choice you're making has its own costs. And you can say, okay, if I'm making this choice, I'm paying that price. But your budget doesn't stretch up. It's not startup plan where you just like series B and C and D. It's like, that's it. That's the amount you have. Uh, unless you start adding people and you start doing things. And um, every choice you make, you might be excited about that choice and there might be a high reward, but you need to understand the risk for it. And you need to really find that right balance. Um, you know, people criticizing a lot of Go for, uh, Rails, for instance, for, for right now. There are a lot of articles about people leaving the community. I mean, I did a while back, but at the same time, right now it's a very safe, safe technology when you, make a, when you make a choice. If you were to choose like Elm or Rust or something else, that's a risky choice. You need to understand what is the gain you will get. What is, why would you do it? Is it really because it's better for the company and you're willing to pay the price? Or is it because you actually find it interesting and you want to play with it. And I think there's, there's this, this balance, and in some cases, you really want to, to make risk, to take risk. For instance, in our case, we use Angular 2, and that's a big risk, but the backend is extremely stable. We don't have any problem. We can move on that, and we know we're good. But finding when and, and how to make these risky choices is what's going to make the difference between you and somebody else. Uh, I have two more points. Defining engineering values. Okay, so this is probably, of all of them, that's probably the most important to me. When you start a company or when you have a small team that start growing, the problem is you're losing this concept of engineering values. And by that, what I mean is, what do we as a team value in the way we write code? And I'm not talking about libraries or something like that. I'm talking about how do we see, what's our worldview on, on programming? Um, for instance, do we, do we prefer a bit of magic or a bit of verbosity? Do we prefer to pay price up front or over time? Like all these different things that would help you define, and usually this is very implicit. It's part of the culture. You have the first few engineers, maybe the CTO is kind of pushing a certain way, but nothing is really being say, said. And you start growing the team and you can see people kind of drifting different ways and now you're having arguments about values that you should not be having arguments about. And it's not a personal choice. It's like, this is the value of the team. You might be disagreeing, but we know what the values are. 
and we know what we want to do. And I think there's not, you know, I didn't give you a list of like the right values because I think this is very, it will depend on who you're working with and you have different ways of solving the same problem. But you need to be clear about that for the entire team. So you will spend way less time arguing about a lot of things. Um, a small thing would be, for instance, dependencies. Do you, are you into dependencies or not into dependencies? Do we prefer to um, write some of our co the code ourselves or are we okay just pushing another gem? So, so a lot of the small things like that end up uh, making a big difference. And linked to that is my last point, is that your job is to make sure that writing bad code is extremely hard for everybody else. I think that's the role of everybody in the company. Um, if you're making it easy for anybody, junior or not, to write bad code, there's something wrong with the way you set up everything else. So of course the values would help, but it's not just that. You can set up tooling. So in Go, for instance, you have this Go font tool. And what it does is, as you're writing your code, every time you save, uh, or every time you run the tool, it would reorganize your code the way it's set by convention. Now, not everybody agrees with the convention, but it doesn't matter. Everybody follows the same lead. And I think doing this kind of exercises where you look at code, if more, and you take 10 people and they look at the code. If nine of them, if, if less than nine of them agree that it's good or bad, that it follows the convention or not, that means there's a problem. I think most of the time when you look at code, people should be saying, oh, this is not the way we do it, or this is not what we want. And you might justify it. In some cases, that's totally fine to be out of it. But most of the time, you want people to be lined up on what it means to write good code according to our own standards. And the standards can be different from one company to the other. You can have different guidelines. Um, you can have different values. But you really want to reduce the frictions within the team of arguing about small things so you can focus on the product you're building. So these are the lessons um, I personally learned. Um, I'm sure you also learned a lot. Um, hopefully some of that was useful and I um, uh, want to thank you for your time. Thank you.